that. God is good. All the time? God is good. Look at somebody and say, somebody? My God is good. Hey, we're glad you're here in the house of the Lord with us this morning. Beautiful weather. Glad you took time out to get up and come worship with us this morning. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Joshua chapter 24. Read for a minute. Get us going. Starting place. Bless you. That's an epic sneeze right there. Joshua chapter number 24. Going to read a couple of verses. Verse 14 and 15. It says this, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Pray with me. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for loving us, God. We just ask that you would come into this place, God, that your presence would be with us. And Father, that you would speak to our hearts today, that you would challenge us with your love and what that looks like for us and what that looks like in our family, God. We need you in our midst. We need you in our lives. We ask that you would come, that you would meet us in this place, that you would touch lives, that you would meet needs. We all have something, God. We know that it can be met by your love. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. So, how many of you were here last Sunday? Anybody here last Sunday? Aren't you you thankful? Didn't Kirk do an awesome job last Sunday? Wasn't you thankful? That's good. Nice little golf clap, yeah. I, I I get a couple of those every once in a while. But the thing is, it blesses me to know that we have a church where I can be gone and where some of us can be gone. We know we have a, had a lot of women that served on a walk to Emmaus, and we're, we're on that walk last weekend. And what a blessing it is to have a place where, you know what, we can have some pieces missing, and we can have some, some people that are gone, but you know what, everything can still get tended to, and we still have a place where we can come and meet with the Lord. That is a great thing. We were at, we went to A&M last week. You see, I have a, yeah, whoop, there you go. They got all kinds of little chants, by the way. But we went to the A&M where my oldest daughter's going to school, and she got her Aggie ring, which she, when she first told me last, last spring, I, this is when we're getting our Aggie ring, you need to get ready. I'm like, what are you talking about a ring? I didn't get no ring in college. I didn't even go to my graduation. But we're finding out that some of this stuff's a big deal. So anyway. We go down there, and, and what a special time it was. It was a special time for my daughter. It was a special time for our family and to get to, to, to be a part of all of it, you know, and just the experience. And, and it was a great time. And as we're there, uh, I'm, I'm thinking and I'm watching, and it just, it, it just it hits me, and I, I'm realizing more and more how blessed that I am, how blessed that we are as a family. My parents were there. My extended family was there, and friends were there, and just everybody uh, participating in this, and, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't talk a lot about my family a lot of times. I don't brag on my kids like I should. I don't do a lot of this stuff because part of the reason is just my personality. The other part is, you know what, everybody's going to make up their own mind anyway. And, and for me and my family, we don't get to hide. We don't get to have secrets. We're pretty much on display for everybody to see, whether it's at church or the basketball game or at work or whatever it is. And so people are going to make up their own decision. But, but I love my family. And I am so grateful for my family. When I look at my family, I, I, I see the differences in our family. And as I, I'm thinking about it this week, and I, I see my wife, and I see how social she is, and I see how... She may be a little over the top for some people, but she always adds life. She adds life to every situation. I see my daughter Neely and how she's growing up, and I I see the influence that she's having on other people in her life. And I look at my daughter Hallie Rose, and I see the impact that she's having with peers and kids that are her age and younger. And I see little mighty man who just seems like ever since he was born, he's just people are drawn to him. And I... I see how my family, I say all this to say that I see how my family makes me better. 
I see how the Lord has used them and is using them to shape me and to shape my life and to challenge me. And then when I see and I experience and I hear about so many families and their struggles and their difficulties, because we know that life is difficult, and sometimes I almost feel guilty, to be honest with you. I feel guilty because my family, it appears, is so blessed. But then I realize, and I remember that this is God's plan. It's family. Somebody say family. His plan is for us to have a family. And though none of us are perfect, his plans come through family. And here's the thing. If you and I want to live epic life and we want to be a part of a life that has momentum, we're going we're gonna to need some family. We're going to have some, need some people in our life to help us. We're going to have to learn how to love our family. We're going to have to learn how to go through life as a family, as a, as a, with other people in our life. And that's this scripture to me, uh, Joshua Usually not shared this way, but the Lord just brought it to me. When Joshua declared this, this scripture to the Israelites, when they had started, they were in the promised land. If you know the story, they're in the promised land, and things are going good, and God's got his hand on them, and things are rocking and rolling. But little by little, they begin to fall away. They begin to serve the gods in, the, in, in that land. They begin to get distracted from the Lord, and Joshua sees it all coming, and he, he, he makes this declaration. He's saying, hey... Man, look how, God, how good God's been to us and how he's got us to this point. And he says, I know I can't make you make the right decision. And I know I can't make you do anything. But as for me and my family, as for me and my household, as for me and the ones that God's given me authority and placed me in the middle of, we are going to serve the Lord. And I love it because he didn't say, hey, I'm going to serve the Lord. And my kids are going to do whatever. And my wife's going to do whatever. He said, no, as for me and my household. We are in this thing together, and God has placed me here. And it's this important that if we're going to live the blessed life, and if we're going to go on into the things that God has for us, it is crucial that our family is a part of this thing. God calls us to serve Him as a family. And I realize that we don't live in a perfect world, and I realize that none of us are perfect. But we have turned this into what, what, what Joshua was saying was, as for me and my family, there's no option. This is what we're going to do. But if we look around honestly in our nation today, it appears that people have decided that this is optional. I mean, we see it in our own church. Sometimes when we see, we see a parent come or we see the mom and dad come and the kids don't come and it's just up to them. And we see some, we have a lot of kids that come, especially young co- kids, they come to church and the parents don't come. It's like, it's just optional. It's just up to everyone. But if we look back objectively, we see that from the beginning of time, God had family in mind. In the beginning of time, in Genesis 1, verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle of all. Let them rule over everything, every creeping creature, everything that's in the earth. We want them to rule over. And then in Genesis 2, 7, the Lord, it says that he formed man out of the dust of the earth and he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and he became a living being. So he's alive. He created man. This plan is beginning to happen. And in verse 18 of Genesis 2, the Lord said, wait a minute, it's not good for this man to be alone. I will make him a helper. I will make him somebody that's suitable to help him out. Can I tell you that every one of us need help? And when we think that we don't need our help from our family or for brothers and sisters in Christ, we are lying to ourselves. He said, it's not good that man would be alone. And in verse 24, he says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. This is where marriage is instituted and his He will be joined with his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. I want you to see this simple. I know you all know it. But God created man, and God created woman to help him that they would do life together. They were to get married, and they were to become together, and they were to become one flesh. That's when, you know, pieces of the puzzle fit together. I'm not going to be explicit about this, but can I just tell you that a man and woman are created where they would fit together. 
That they would come together. This was God's original plan. That they would have these tasks. That they would rule over the earth. That they would multiply. They would have dominion. That they would create the kingdom of God. They would expand the kingdom of God. And it wasn't by going and fighting. And it wasn't by doing all this stuff. Those things happen at times. But it happens as we multiply and we share with the earth what God is doing in the family. He told Adam and Eve, go forth and fruitful and multiply and the more you go the more they're going to be like you which is going to be like me and you're going to show the world what this thing is supposed to look like it happens through family somebody say family we're all a part we're all a product of this scenario in some way even if our family is imperfect which all of our families are imperfect but we're all a product of this equation we're either a husband or a wife we're a mom or we're a dad we're a son or we're a daughter, we're a brother, we are a sister. We are all a part of this original plan. But how many of you know that since the beginning of time, this, this plan of God has been attacked? It's been attacked from the very beginning when the serpent comes to Eve and he's been attacking family. He says, I'm going to come in between you and I, don't, I want you to do something that God told you not to do. And he's been attacking the family and we see it from the very beginning. Why does the enemy attack family? Because it's God's will. Because it's how life is going to happen. It's how blessings flow. It's how, it's how things get done. It's through the family. And so what the enemy wants to do is destroy the family. He did it to Adam and Eve. He did it to the marriage. He did it to their children. And on and on and on it goes right down to you and me. He's still trying to attack our families. He wants to bring separation between husband and wife. He wants the, the, the kids mad at the parents and the parents mad at the kids where there is uh, destruction. But when we get this right, when we try to walk in God's plan, what happens is it is epic and it creates momentum in individuals, in churches, in communities, and in a nation. You see, when a family gets healthy, all of a sudden the kids begin to raise up and they are individually healthy and they know that there's a plan for them. And when a family gets healthy, a church will get healthy. And when a church gets healthy, a community starts to get healthy and it carries over all the way to the nations. When we start getting healthy, it overflows. Now, we know this. Family is not easy. Somebody say, that's right. Family is not easy, and this is why we have to be intentional. It doesn't just happen by happenstance. We don't just luck into it because our feelings change and things happen in our lives and things happen as we go along. We have to learn how to be intentional about loving our family. You see... If we're honest today, when, when, when it, I could tell on some of your faces the minute we started talking about family. When we start thinking about family, for some of us it brings joy, it brings love, it brings good memories. But for others, when we talk about family, it brings pain and it brings disgust and it brings anxiety and it brings love. It brings anger and it brings bad memories. I understand that and I'm not going to make light of that because I know it's real. I know that's real for many of you sitting here today, but my goal today is simply this, is to challenge us and to encourage us to love our family better, to do better than we've done to this point. None of us are perfect, none of us have been perfect, and none of us are going to be perfect tomorrow, but I'm striving for something that aligns with God's plan, with His design, because how many of you know God's plan doesn't fail? God's word does not return void. And the closer I get to aligning with it, the more likely I am going to have success. And so we need to understand this first. It's God's original plan. It's family. Somebody say family. Family. Marriage. Family is a gift from God. Marriage is a gift from God. Parents are a gift from God. Children are a gift from God. Siblings are a gift from God. And this is what I see in my life and I see in my other lives we get away from God's plan we veer off a little bit sometimes with the right intentions and sometimes it's you know it needs to be for a minute but we get away from God's plan and I don't know about you but I'm just going to be honest with you as I prepared this week and as I'm praying about it this week I need to do better at this I don't know about you but I do know about you but oftentimes I see this we treat other people outside of our family better than we do our own family. Maybe you don't. 
but I know that I do. I have less patience and self-control. I'm not as gentle or spend as much time as I do with other people as I, that I need to with my own kids. I have love, less grace and mercy and love. I don't appreciate enough. I don't respect enough. I don't honor my family enough. I'm quick to forgive people, and I'm quick to not be offended by people in my life who, 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 who I feel like wrong, and, and I let it go, and I go on. But sometimes with my family, I hang on to those things. I hang on to negative statements and things that they've done to me. You know this? Can I just be honest with you? Sometimes I spend all day and half the night listening to other people and encouraging them and helping them. But you know what I do with my own family sometimes? I say, you know what? Tomorrow we'll do it. Tomorrow I'll help you out. I have compassion and I encourage people. Hey, it's okay, man. Come on. You're doing it. Let's go. Let's keep going. But yet with my own family, I have high expectations and I expect them to exceed the bare minimum. Can I tell you, we have to do better. I have to do better. Because our families are crucial. And this is the reality that the enemy doesn't want us to realize is that our families are being attacked. Every one of us, today as we sit here, some form of our family is being attacked in one way or the other. And we've made it into a personal thing. And we've made it into something that I'm offended or I'm upset about. And so we've stepped out of love and we're stepping out of what God has for us. And we're allowing the enemy to come into our life. What does God say? This is not real in depth, but just a few things. What does God say about our family? He says, honor your father and mother. As a young person, Exodus 20, 12, this is a commandment of the Lord that comes with the promise. If you honor your father and mother, then you will live a long life. We often do just the opposite. Why? Because fill in the blank. Because they weren't there, because they did this, because they didn't do that, because all this stuff, they don't deserve me to be honoring them. Can I tell you that this is not an option? This is a commandment. And God says, honor your father and mother, for without them, you wouldn't be here. They may not have given us the best chance, they may not have done everything, but still God says, honor your father and mother. How, about, how, do, how do we deal with our children? Do your children ever frustrate you? couple of us they ever aggravate us it gets difficult our children God says this in Psalms 127 3 he says behold children are a gift from God they're a blessing the more of them you have it's like having a, a quiver that's full of arrows for a man children are a blessing sometimes you got to tell yourself multiple times children are a blessing from God even when you're old and have children, it is a blessing from God. Tess, I love you. <laughs> but here's the thing. If we're honest, many in our culture, it's almost like we feel like our kids are a detriment to my life, of my plans, of what I have going on, of my hobbies. These kids, these kids, these kids. No, they're a blessing from God. This is the way the Lord created it. Can I tell you that if you were proactive enough to be a part of having a child, God says that you ought to be called enough and understand that you are called to lay down your life and help raise your children now. That you've had your shot, man. It's time for your children. And what about marriage? Talking about family. How's marriage? Here, you got time for this? We're going to read a few scriptures. Because this is important, and I want to slow down. Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. It says, wives, listen women, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands? Love your wives just as Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. I already read that. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also the church gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle, good news for the ladies, or any such thing, but she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their wives as their own bodies. For he who loves his own 
wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined with his wife. They shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual must among you also is to love his wife even as himself and the wife must see that she respects her husband. So there is a whole lot here. I'd ask you to look at this and think about it. And I'm not going to camp on it. I'm not going to unfold this. But I want you to see that this is God's design. We live in this culture where it's men against women and, well, you're, you're, you're one of those guys or you're whatever, whatever. No, this is God's design. God created man. He said it's not good that man would be alone, so he created woman. He created the woman to help the man, to come alongside him, to hold him accountable, to help him do more than what he could do on his own so that they would procreate, they would have children that would grow up in this plan and walk and live like them. It's important to understand this. The man is created to be the head of the household. It's not a masculinity thing. It's not that he's better than the woman. It's God's plan. The blessings are going to flow through the man. The, the, the things that are pro- provision is going to flow through the man. It's not that he's better, he's more able, he's any of this stuff. It's just this is the plan of God, them coming alongside of each other, that a woman should submit to the man. We live in a culture where the, many times we've had to have it that women have had to lead the household. Not saying that God can't use this, but it's just not exactly God's plan. Now, the men love this part of this scripture. Women submit. You heard everything he said right there. This is the way it is. But it also says a couple verses later in verse 25 that a man ought to love his wife like Christ. How did Christ love? He laid down his life. You see, here's the fallacy that men are looking for women to do do what they want them to do, but we're not doing what Christ did. When Christ said, I'm going to lay down my life, and this is how you're going to love your wife, you're going to give up your hobby, you're going to give up your addictions, you're going to give up all this stuff, and you're going to lay down your wife so that your wife, lay down your life so that your wife will become better, and when you lay down your life, your woman is going to be more apt to, this is some tongue twisting in here. (laughs) You get the picture. When we love correctly, our wives are going to want to submit. They're going to want to help us instead of us both fighting for control and position and power and none of it done out of love because this is love that a man would lay down his life as Christ did. That doesn't mean we boss and badger our wives. That means we sanctify her with the Word of God. We speak over them and tell them how God is cleansing them and how God has created them and how glorious and beautiful beautiful they are we cleanse them with the word of God the same way Christ cleansed us with his own blood this sounds crazy and a little bit over the top but can I tell you that this stuff works this stuff works when we start aligning with it when we when we have a wife that says you know what man you're supposed to be leading this house you lead this house in prayer you direct us we're going to work together but let the man step into the assignment that God has created him to be I don't know about you but we I have to do better and I would say this broad scale we as a culture need to get better at this and I want to show you why because the biggest message that we have how many of you want to reach somebody with the love of Jesus four of us (laughs) we're in trouble this is the biggest message that we have for those of us who have a family it comes out of our family Because it's the fruit. It's what people are seeing. It's not what they're hearing come out of our mouth per se. But it's the fruit, the message that our life produces. I had a man this spring. And he came to me and he said this. He says, I've been watching you since you were a kid. And immediately I'm like, oh dear Lord. And he said, I remember about 15 or so years ago when you started preaching, and I was like, I don't know about this. Is this this for real? I mean, what is this? He said, but I've seen you with your own family. And he said, I saw your parents with you, and now as your children are growing up, I see you with them. And he said, this is what I want you to know. I'm seeing the fruit 
of the Lord at work in your life. And he's saying, I'm telling you this because I had some questions about the Lord and I had some questions about you. He said, but as I've seen it unfold and I see what's happening, my faith is getting stronger in the Lord. And can I tell you this? I'm not saying this because it's, that's why I don't sh sh ever share stuff like this. But I'm, share, I'm showing you this because here's what I want you to see. It wasn't because of a message I preached in the last 15 years. It wasn't because I pastor a church. It was because of my family. It had nothing to do with me. It had to do with my family. And I want you to understand that it can be for you, and I know it is for me, but my family makes me better. When I... My parents, when I see what they've done, and I've seen the patience and the grace and the encouragement and the love and all of that, and then when I see my wife and I see my children and I see how they keep me accountable and I see how the Lord uses them to press me and mold me and make me step up. Yet, I'm often the hardest on them. And I often show them the love of God the least. You see, in our families... We have to learn how to bring solutions and not problems. Sometimes in our family, it's like we're, we're all trying to vie for our position and vie for our place, and, and we create problems. And here's the reality that if we're in a family, we ought to be striving to make our family better, not create more trouble for them. Can we be real? If we look around in this day and age, how many people, how many kids do you know? And they're growing up and they're fighting and they're struggling. And they are trying so hard to overcome what's been placed on them. To overcome something at home. And overcome a separated family. And overcome addiction. And overcome the stuff that they've seen. They're trying to overcome it. And we live in a culture where husband and wife are fighting and they're mad and everything's about the way I want it and the way I should get it and all this stuff. And we have siblings fighting within families, playing cutthroat with each other. We have in-laws hating each other, hating the other side of the family. And we forget that God's plan is that we ought to be making each other better. That we ought to bearing, be bearing with each other. Proverbs eleven twenty nine 29 says this. It says, he who troubles his own house will inherit the wind. In other words, did you get that? He's saying you can be as spiritual as you want. You can sing the songs. You can know the psalms. You can go to church. But if you're causing problems for your family, you're going to weep the whirlwind. You're going to reap a mess. In other words, you, you ain't got much chance if you're causing trouble in your family. Family is something that is so precious that so many of us take for granted. I know I have. But when we understand the heartbeat of God and we understand how He loves us and how He's relational and we can talk about loving our neighbor and we can talk about reaching the lost, but until we learn how to love our family, friend, until we learn how to, to love our children and love our wives with the love of God, then nothing else is really going to work out for us because this is it. This is our first ministry, and I have to repent so many times when I'm working so hard to get to a walk to Emmaus and go encourage some football team or go cheer somebody on or go hang out at some deal all in the name of the Lord, but yet my family is struggling and come back to a place to say, it's our family first. Don't let the enemy lie to you anymore and think that by doing something else but yet negating your family is going to make it all okay because at the heart of it, it begins with our family. This is our first ministry. This is our highest calling. Can I tell you that the Lord said to me, man, if it costs you your family to serve me in the church and the community, then you better slow down because if you don't get this right right here, none of this other stuff matters. The whirlwind will get us. And I just am off track. But I'm just saying this, man, and woman, and young person. Life is too short, and it's too uncertain. None of us are promised tomorrow. We can have a 20-year plan. It can look so good. But none of us know what's going to happen tomorrow. We have today. A couple of weeks ago, most of you know this, but I had a good friend in Abilene. He lost a six-year-old son. 
That same week, there was a family that lost their dad, had young kids. Can I tell you that going through all of any, all those people's minds wasn't what was wrong with their family. It wasn't what somebody had said or somebody had done or should have done, but none of that was the issue. All they wanted was, 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 was just wishing they had their family back. Because sometimes we don't realize how important it is till later on. And we've got this small, this small window to love each other, to glorify God in our families. Job, think about Job, man. Job chapter 1, he lost everything. He lost his kids. He lost his possessions. He didn't have a warning of it. He didn't have anything. It was just gone. And he was a righteous man. In family, we have to love each other. We have to forgive each other. We have to uh, be patient with each other. We have to keep encouraging each other and keep loving, lifting each other up. It's not that hard. It's difficult, but it's not really that hard. Colossians 3.13, he says, Bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, let it go. Just as the Lord forgave you, also you should forgive in our families we have to have this Ephesians 5 21 and be subject to submit to one another in the fear of Christ can I tell you young people there's young people in here I know your young, your parents wear you out I know they're not as cool as some of us <laughs> just kidding as parents understand this about your parents because I'm a parent we're not perfect we're gonna mess up we realize you're not going to understand it. But here's the thing. Your parents want the best for you. We want the best for you. I know our kids, because, you know, we're growing up, they're kind of starting to get it a little bit. But they thought we'd been too hard, and they didn't understand why we restricted their phone and why we wouldn't let them do some of the things. We wouldn't let them go to some of the places. And I know they thought we were fuddy-duddy, stick in the muds, whatever. But it's because we want it better. We want it what's best, and we know what's waiting for you and how there's stuff lurking out there. What your parents really want is they want the best for you. They want a little respect from you, and they want a little time with you. They want to know. They, when, you, when, you, when you get older, man, you're cool, and you got all your stuff going on. Your parents want a little time with you. Learn to honor your father and mother. It's not going to be easy all the time, but honor them. For this is pleasing to the Lord. You know what? The reason some of our parents didn't deserve to be honored because they had deficiencies in their life and they need the Lord. So we need to honor them so that maybe in some way, somehow, they might experience the love and the grace of God that they never got as a kid themselves. Amen? Here's the thing. We all have a part to play in a godly family. A godly family that will ultimately be epic for the Lord. And we all have a part in it. Every one of us. 1 Timothy 5.8, I'm going to try to quit here. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those in his household, he has denied the faith, and he is worse than an unbeliever. This scripture, provide, is usually, and rightly so, directed at dads. Provide for our families. Provide for your kids. But here's what I want to, I wonder if we took this and applied it to all of our lives as part of a family. If a dad took this seriously, providing for his family, check. If a mom, check. I'm going to do my job in providing. If a kid, check. If I'm a child, check. If I'm a sibling, check. I'm going to do my job in providing. Whatever that is, we all have something to bring to the table. And if we all do what we can do, how is that going to bless the family? But if we don't do our part, and we don't do our job in providing, then it says I'm worse than an unbeliever. So I'm going to stop. Music team can come. But here's the thing. Just a few things. God created one man and one woman, and he had family in mind. One man, one woman come together. They have kids. They multiply, they become fruitful, it turns into a family. We're all a product of this scenario, good, bad, or ugly. No matter what our upbringing, no matter if it was good, no matter if it was bad, no matter whatever it is, we're a product of it. A man and woman coming together, here we are, so, so here's the question, now what? 
Not about looking back, but about looking forward. This is where I'm at. What am I going to do going forward? Maybe you're here today and you're dreaming. You're dreaming of a family. Maybe you're praying for a family. You're praying for what this is going to look like going forward. Maybe, maybe you're here and you're trying to rebuild a family. It hasn't been easy. It's been difficult. You've been ravaged. But now you're trying to rebuild this thing. You're asking the Lord for help. Maybe you're fighting for your family. Whatever it is, I'm just saying this. Let us recognize our shortcomings. Let us recognize where we've been. And then in this moment, commit to do better. Commit to love deeper. Commit to go forward. Striving to align with God's plan and have an epic family. And can I tell you, it doesn't start with your wife. It doesn't start with your kids. It doesn't start with your parents. It starts with you. It starts with me. What is my role in this? How can I do my part in loving? Committing to love our family. Not waiting till next week, not waiting till next year, but committing today that I will walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, thankfulness, respect, whatever. And so I'm done, but because I know some of us are thinking, I'm doing all I can. I'm loving, but these rest of them. So I'm going to leave you with a question. And you answer the question. How is your life working out? And some of them are like, right now, oh, it's good, I'm doing good. But the end of the question is this. How is your life working out for those around you? You see, we, we can do good, we can be right, we can do all this stuff. But ultimately, our lives not only need to work for us, because in Christ Jesus, not I live, but Christ lives in me. And that means that it's about other people. And so if I'm doing this right, the people around me are to be benefiting as much or more than I am. What's the Lord saying to you? Pray with me. Father, I love you. Thank you for loving us, God. We thank you for family. And I understand that, God, none of us, none of us have the perfect family, God. But we wouldn't be uh, condemned by that, God. But we would just understand the plan that you have for us. And so best we can, God, all we can do is what we can do. And so, Lord, I just pray, Father, that there would be a, a spirit of family in this place, within our families, within this church as a family, God, that we would all begin to do our part in providing love and encouragement, accountability and strength and patience and kindness and forgiveness and all the stuff that we all need. And so, Lord, I just speak into this place, family. And, Father, that you would just anoint us with your love, that we've been talking about how you love us and we need to love others and we need to love you. And God, we would begin that and practice that with our own family. Because God, if a family gets strong, we can face anything. When a family gets strong and healthy, God, it overflows to other families. It overflows to other kids. It overflows to other people who are going through difficulties. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would close up, clothe us with your power and the ability to love our families this week if you're here today and you say you know what I, ha I don't even have a family do you know that you're called to be a part of the family of God that Christ Jesus died for you so that you could live and be a part of God's family if you've never done that to, I just want to encourage you to do that say I, I need Jesus I need to accept what he did for me and for all the rest of us, I just want you to listen to the Lord and think about the love and the calling on your life. And no matter where you might be in this equation, what is he saying to you? And how do you need to respond? How do you need to begin loving more deeply? God, meet us in this place as we close in worship. The altars are open if you want to come with a spouse or a friend or a family. Or, or maybe you just need to come yourself. If you need prayer for healing or any, any of that, we'll certainly pray with you and for you. God, move in this place as we close, close in Jesus' name.